They say you are what you eat, so I don't eat chicken feet. But I love me some of Grandma's pickled beets. Well, cut it up, put it in the pan, throw it over your shoulder and see where it lands right here in the farmer's kitchen. Baiters, taters, beans and corn, the cows in the barn and the sheep's been shorn, kids in the barnyard chasing Grandpa's chicken. Chicken, chicken. Spices, slices, cuts and dices, gonna slash your grocery prices right here in the farmer's kitchen. Help you grow your garden good with recipes to suit your mood. Try some grub you've never tried before. Smash it with a wooden mallet, gonna educate your palate. Right here in Farmer's Kitchen, in Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. We're gonna cook something good now. Funding for Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen is brought to you by... Harvest Energy Solutions, Harvest Cabins, when you absolutely have to get away. The city of Stanford, Kentucky, come back home to Stanford. Woods Equipment Company has every tool you need to make working the land as rewarding as hunting it. Good Foods Co-op, Marksbury Farm Market, Weisenberger Mill, your village shop. Well, Mrs. Farmer, welcome to the Farmer's Country Kitchen. Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. You know what? You've been chopping cilantro. It smells good, doesn't it? And red onions. Mm-hmm. And limes. And I see tacos. You know, tonight we've got a complete thought process. I love shows like this where things come together. We go find one thing, one thing leads to the next thing. And this was really kind of, we never plan anything that much. Mm -hmm. We live spontaneously. Aquaponics. Wow. Bluegrass. Mm -hmm. Aquaponics. They're raising tilapia. Now, most of the time, not on my soapbox, but I know how tilapia is raised in some countries. I I don't like the whole aspect of that. But I got to talk to these folks. Tilapia is delicious meat. I caught some in Florida one time on a fly rod. It is good. Beautiful meat. And I found out how they were raising it. And you and I got to end the discussion with this nice young lady. And we thought, we've got to go visit these people. I wanted fresh fish. Now, we eat ours as soon as we catch it. Exactly. Now, it's fairly expensive to get in your boat, pay for the gas, mm-hmm. go to where you got to go. So how can you get some fresh fish right here in central Kentucky? I don't know. You know how it's raised. I've got an idea. Okay. Let's go to Bluegrass Aquaponics. Let's see if we can find us some fish. Let's start in between Versailles and Midway. We are Midway, between Midway and Versailles. Laura Ginter, how is this operation functioning so wonderfully I've got 10 gazillion questions I want to ask you. I'm seeing all this wonderful green stuff. (laughs) Mm, That's really good. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. What's going on here? Why is this working like this? We got fish over here. Uh We're going to talk about this in great detail. And plants over here, and they work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And how so? The fish waste is our fertilizer. We don't. Our, poo, our fish poo is our fertilizer. Yeah, we'll just put it out that way. So you can't add chemicals. If you put any chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, it hurts the fish. So this is all a natural way to fertilize stuff. So you've got a great natural flavor. But that right there, what I just tasted, was so pure, so leafy, so green, so wonderful. There's so much to explain, I don't even know where to start. But first of all, you're raising tilapia, uh-huh. which is a firm flesh, beautiful fish. Mm-hmm. They are from... Technically, there are ranges. From the Nile River is where they originally came from. Right. So there are warm water fish. We have to have a warm water fish because the plants have to have warm water so that they work in harmony. They can't be cold, so they, you have to maintain certain temperatures in mm-hmm. here. Now, how does the, the very fact that it's what well, you're using the sunlight, obviously, mm-hmm. and you're using the gases and everything to warm this place up, but how do you manage to maintain temperatures in the wintertime that everything doesn't perish? We have two gas heaters. You can see one hanging right up there. Okay. And one on the other side. 
keep it. It'll get chilly at night. It might get a little below 60, but lettuce mm -hmm. loves 60 degree weather. But the water still stays warm, so the roots stay warm. And then the fish are happy up there. It might get, the water gets around 70 in the winter time. And the fish slow down a little bit. They like it more 75 to 80, but they're happy. What you have here is basically fish. They, you pull the waste out of the water. Mm -hmm. The waste comes over here. It's filtered. The waste is filtered. Yes. Uh -huh. And you bring it over here. You don't have soil per se. No. It comes right out here. Under, this is wet under here, uh -huh. right? It's wet. It's about a foot deep of water underneath, and the roots hang down underneath. And they, wow. they collect more of the dirt to clean the water before it goes back to the fish. The nutrients that the waste provides, it's just like in a traditional garden, you'll use horse manure, sheep manure, whatever. But that's a warm-blooded animal. This is a cold-blooded animal, so we're not dealing with E. coli or anything like that which is another huge benefit. Wow. You actually have over in your tomatoes, they look like rocks. What is that? Mm -hmm. That's called grow stone. Okay. It's recycled glass. Some smart person took all this glass that we're recycling, turned it basically back into solid sand, made porous rocks out of it. So it's kind of like a lava rock. So it holds uh -huh. moisture. It holds moisture and all the good bacteria grows in all those pores so that the good nutrients are taken up by the roots in that soil. Not soil, soilless. Soilless. Growing media. Now, one thing I notice about your plants in my garden is mine have gazillions of holes in them from the critters because I don't <laughs> use any kind of pesticides uh -huh. or anything. So the bugs get some, I get some. Right, we you share. share. And uh -huh. I, I don't like that, but it is what it is. But I'm looking at these beautiful tomato plants. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at all sorts of green stuff, peppers. You grow cucumbers. What all do you grow out here? We have kale, Swiss chard, collards. Like you said, the peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers. We have some beets growing. Eggplant is growing up there. Basil, herbs. Mm -hmm. We have cilantro, parsley. Need to get some dill and some other herbs growing. This was a fairly complicated process. When, when you know, I asked the question, how did this get started? Uh huh. And it was a mission trip. It was a mission trip to Haiti. Yeah. We went down there, and they were starting an aquaponic system. They had, didn't have it built. All they had were the ribs of a greenhouse, and they needed someone to come down commit to coming down and building it and getting it up and running. And my husband and I did that. So we were down there. I was with him for six months. Then he went back for three months and got it totally running, water in it. Everything was flowing when he came back and then we handed it over to somebody else. You could pretty much support the community right here. Absolutely. I mean, how many people, if you utilized every bit of the space, you could feed like the better part of the area right around here? Oh, definitely. It, the figures are that we could raise 3,465 pounds of fish reason I remember that, that's our address. It was funny when the numbers came out, it's like, I'll remember that one. And over 44,000 heads of lettuce, we call each one a head, right. even though it's a leaf lettuce, over 44,000 a year. So that's a lot, you can feed a lot of people with that. People can actually come to your place, I, I suppose they'd have to call ahead of time. It would be good, because we like the fish, they're eating fish food, fish taste kind of like what they are. So right. we like to pull them out of their tank that they swim in, live in, until they're like eight months old, at least a pound and a half, a lot of them are two pounds. We pull them out of that tank and put them in another tank and let their system clean out. Just like putting out. a possum under the wash tub for three days and feeding him like <laughs> milk. You've done that? Well, I've heard about it. Okay, all right. <laughs> I just get my possum on the side of the road. Oh, yum, there's a lot fresh. of that. Yeah, you know. mm -hmm. So the fish stay in the purge tank for a few days, kind of clean their systems out, then they're ready to go. So it is good if people know they want it in for the weekend, call us Monday or Tuesday. We'll pull it out of the tanks, put it in the purge tanks. Fish fry fish fry this weekend. Let me know a few days ahead of time. I'll have the fish ready for you. So I can come over here and get tomatoes and I can make my salad. Mm -hmm. I can have my fish, cucumbers, the whole deal. And beets. Beets growing that, that, Down in that, that sandy rock thing. Uh huh. Wow. Can we go look at your tomatoes? Yes, absolutely. Now what's that like stalky plant right over there. Oh, the one way over there in the corner? Yeah, that one. That's collards. There. And the plant right closest to me is a cucumber. It's got some real nice yellow blooms on it. Um, is that what you were talking about? The one right next to it there. Oh, that's the collards over on the far side. They're really good. <gasps> what are you doing? I mean a tomato. <laughs> now, how am oh, I going to make wonder. any money? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a dollar for it. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just got to tell you. That's got the taste. Of a real tomato. Of a real tomato. Summertime. What are you doing here that other people what are, what are you doing that other people aren't doing while what? I'm eating this tomato? <laughs> well, like I've told you, it's natural fertilizer. There aren't any chemicals put in there, so you don't have oh, any chemical no. flavor. Isn't that a nice meaty tomato too? Now, I know we play a lot and we act silly, 
and everybody says, farmer, you'll eat anything. But let me tell you what, I got a pretty developed olfactory system. <laughs> this, you want more? <laughs> no, you go ahead. Mm. I, I can eat them anytime oh, I want to. Oh, mom. Good stuff. That's the real deal. We'll come back to this interview in just a second. <laughs> so, the question people are asking now is, can I go there and buy some stuff? Absolutely. How's Absolutely. it work? What's we, your address? We are, our address is 3465 Old Frankfort Pike, Versailles. But we, like you said, we're halfway between Midway and Versailles, and I'm going to give a little shout out to Wallace Station down the road. We are two tenths of a mile towards Lexington, past Wallace they Station. They some good grub over there. Oh, they do have some good stuff, yeah. You know, if you're going to get fish, you need to call ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And you can supply, do you have a, a maximum amount, minimum amount, or? We've never had anybody go over our maximum, so just give us a try. This is a beautiful thing you got going on here. Thank you. You have a new regular customer, and I hope lots of folks out there are going to see what you got going on and enjoy these things as well. Never ending supply of fried green tomatoes right here. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. You are welcome. Are you super impressed with I your operation? Impressed. I bet you want one of those, don't you? You know what? I started thinking about that. You know, and I always go to them, period. Right. They're, they're closed. I'm going to get my stuff over there. But why couldn't we do this on a small <laughs> scale right out here? I bet we will, won't we? <laughs> why not? <laughs> You know, uh, I, I like to have a small greenhouse, mm -hmm. but man, it's just right around the corner. That's convenient. It's clean. It's such a clean operation. You know, we looked at their vegetables, no bugs. It's just yeah. fantastic. Good looking fish, too. It's fantastic what, what's going on in the food world. Now, speaking of the food world, in order to get this beautiful boneless filet, now look at this. Is that not a good looking piece of fish? It is. That is a boneless filet. Now, you and I, for years, have been catching our own fish. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, sometimes we'll let our fish sit overnight in right. the cooler on ice. That lets them kind of stiffen out. We have cleaned how many bluegill at a time? Too many. Two million, <laughs> two zillion, two yeah. gazillion. Now, once you get in a pattern, you can do a bunch of fish. And we really can yeah. do a fish in less than 30 seconds. So It's really quick, fun. It is fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now remember, once you catch a bunch of fish, the work begins. Right. But if you get just enough for a mess right here, it's it, worth didn't it. Take, it didn't take long It's worth it. Here's our real quick way to fillet fish. Now you can cut along the rib cage. There's a million ways you can do it. We're not telling you this is the only way, but this is the way we do it. All right, when it comes to cleaning fish, first have a nice work area like we don't have. <laughs> this is not very solid. Basically, here's the way to clean most freshwater fish. Cut behind the gill and the pectoral fin. Go down to the backbone, cut back to the tail, going along the backbone. Use the bend of your knife to run along the back of that backbone. Flop that piece over from the tail. Work your way back using the fish itself as weight. Pull against it and you'll come out with a whole piece. Simply cut the rib cage out. Now this is tilapia. It has a little red meat so you can trim up that red meat and guess what? You have a boneless wonderful fillet. Fill along the edges to see if there's any bones but guess what? This is simply a wonderful way to get a boneless fillet out of most any type of freshwater fish. Okay, we've got our fish, we've got our fresh organic. That smells so good. good. When you have the lime and cilantro and the red onions, you know you got something yeah, good. Delicious. But if you're going to do a, a Kentucky beer batter, we need a Kentucky beer. Good idea. You no, know, I wish I knew some old country boys that were making beer. <laughs> I thought you I did. I might find some. Watch this. DH, how's it going today? Excellent. Good to have you. All right. First of all, Country Boy Brewery. Yes, sir. We got fish. Uh-huh. Now, what do you need when you get fish to make a good batter? You got to have some good beer in you it. You got to have some good beer. Absolutely. Now, we start looking around at some different beer people in the area. We like local folks. Um, yeah. What am I, who am I going to come to? Country, country Boy. Country I mean, boys, obviously. Good. Yeah. So, I found out about you guys, and we have talked back and forth on the phone, and we try, y'all are busy. We are. We are like BC Alternative. You are building stuff over here. Let me tell you how I was introduced to you. All right, a friend of mine who is just happens to be a, a policeman, his name's Darren. We like policemen a lot. He's a state trooper, fine guy. He comes to me and says, try some of this. He's got a growler. Uh -huh. That's good beer. I'm thinking, this is really good. Is it from Belgium or, I mean, where's it from? Oh, it's high praise. Oh, I'm telling you. He said, no, this is Cougar Bay. I said, Cougar bait. I mean, what are you talking about? He says Country Boy Brewing. 
I know I'm not alone because once I've tried this stuff, I find out, well, everybody knows about cougar bait. Well, let's back up. How did this whole thing get started? And how did you, how, what was your involvement in it? Well, we, at Country Boy, we say we're the embodiment of contradiction. If we told you that all these bearded guys from Kentucky had our roots in Japan, you'd say that uh, we're crazy. But I actually got into craft beer during a three-year stint when I was teaching English in Japan with one of my partners. Uh, that's where, uh, you know, everything kind of was born. And through my love of craft beer that I got there, came back to Kentucky, born and raised in Scott County. Uh, we knew we wanted to get a, a microbrewery started, and so met my other two partners, and uh, kind of the rest is history. So you're a mad scientist? To an extent, I'm more of the, uh, that, that's two of my, my partners, the brothers, Nathan and Evan Coppage. The science is more on their end of it. I'm much more on the fun-loving uh, craft beer culture side of everything. But, so uh, where did it start? Somebody's living room? We started homebrewing in Nate's backyard. Uh, Jeff Beagle, one of my other uh, partners, was homebrewing at his house. He actually won a, uh, the Alltech uh, Lexington Brewing Company, the pro-am that they had. Kind of gave us some confidence there to, that, we hey, we could do this on a, on a real scale. And, uh, you know, from there, this is where we get excited, so you got to forgive me. Uh, <laughs> no, go ahead, talking about saying. making beer, you know, it's, this, the processes are the same, but the scale is so much different. So we were brewing every week, trying to get consistency down. And then Jeff one day was like, hey, guys, if we're going to do this, let's do it. So he kicked us in the pants, and uh, we signed an LLC and started a business and opened the doors February 10th, 2012. And kind of, you know, it's cliche to say, the rest is history. We've grown leaps and bounds since then. We did 500 barrels of beer the first year we were open, which is about uh, 31 gallons to a to a barrel. Uh, this year we're going to do 10,000. Only in, this will be our fourth year in business. So it's a crazy growth scheme. Lexington's thirsty. We hope to stay that way. Now let me ask you this. Cougar bait, is that your number one? Number one by far. It's Who's your number 60. two? Shotgun wedding. Shotgun, Shotgun wedding? I've not tried that Shotgun yet. wedding is a, a vanilla infused brown ale. Uh, Cougar bait makes about 65-70% of production. 20% is, is shotgun and all the other crazy different beers that we've done uh, make up the rest of it. So we pride ourselves on being experimental right now in the tap room. You've got about 21 different beers on that we make in-house. And if you're going to do quality beer, it's quality ingredients. You can't across the board, no matter what you're making, you can't make a quality product if you don't start with quality ingredients like you said. Uh, but yeah, you're exactly right. We, we try to start, we don't cut corners. So that means no, adjunct, no adjuncts that detract from flavor, no extracts. If we're going to have a fruited beer, it's got real fruit in it. Vanilla beans like and shotgun that. wedding, for example, whole real vanilla beans, which are extremely expensive. You know, we talk about cooking, you know, which you're extremely familiar with. The difference between whole real vanilla beans and vanilla extract, you can't fake it. Oh, yeah. That real bean flavor is real bean flavor. So that's what we're committed to. As I look around, I see these. Yep, stainless steel conical fermenters. So fermenters. The, fermenters, exactly. So what happens? Explain the whole process. So uh, we got our brew house right where the beer is brewed. So we've got our crushed grain, which is two-row barley mixed with our whatever malt bill we're going to have for that product that we're making. Uh, it's going to sit in some, we're going to steep it in hot water, just like you're making coffee or tea. We're going to extract all those good flavors out of the grain. Once that's done, we put it in the boil kettle where we're going to cook it for about an hour, hour and a half. That's where we're going to add our hops. If we're making a pumpkin beer, we're going to add some pumpkin in there, some spices in there. Uh, after about 90 minutes in there, we roll into the fermenters. In the fermenter, it's where we add our yeast. It's where the magic happens, obviously. You know, the, the yeast is going to consume those good sugars we've extracted from the grain. And once yeast is consuming sugars, that's a byproduct of that, you get alcohol production. And so we're tasting. We get to where we need to be out of here. And then from here, it goes into a bright tank. From there to cans or kegs, and then to you. How long a process is it? Oh, start with grain to glass, on average, we say two and a half weeks, which means from the minute that it's brewed to the minute it's able to, to be consumed, about two and a half weeks. Now, some, some of our beers are quicker. Some of them are longer. They get really long once we go into bourbon barrels or we do barrel aging, which be, because we're in Kentucky, uh, it's something that's kind of the you know, industry standard. But uh, I'm people looking, are into I'm looking now. At barrels here. We've got bourbon barrels on the front, uh, which we get uh, because we're in Kentucky. They're easy to get yeah. uh, to a point. We've got wine barrels. We've got some Gene Ferris Winery recently, and then we've got four huge sherry casks that you see that are from Portugal uh, that had a Monteado in them of all stuff. So that, that that's the other fun thing. You get a product that's done. You throw it into barrels. The barrel takes over. The magic of the wood take over, and what you get on the end is something really special. People say, I want to try that. Mm -hmm. There's a spot they can do that, right? Well, you can come on site to the tap room. Uh, we have 24 beers on tap. Most of them we make in-house. Uh, we have some guest beers from other local breweries and regional breweries as well. Uh, but you can come here, you can taste. Uh, you can buy a product to go. You can fill up growlers if there's a product, which is a 64-ounce jug that we're talking to your first experience with. You can also come and drink pints as well. So we, we're lucky in Kentucky that uh, we, the laws allow us to have that on site. It's basically the greatest R&D facility that you have. You know, we can find out what people are thinking about the product. Right there. And it's the freshest you're going to be able to drink it. Then if you're looking for it, you should be able to find it on the shelf. Right now in cans, the only thing you can find is Cougar Bait. Shotgun Wedding is coming. Uh, but if, it, if they sell beer, they should be able to get it. So ask them if they don't have it. Do you realize that you, you kind of got this thing rolling already more than you know? 
And your your very uh, insignia, your very uh, logo there, mm -hmm. is right. Yes. For the time, and it's right for what you're doing. Well, we we feel like you know, right guys, right time, right place. Uh, the beer's pretty doggone good too, which doesn't hurt. But at the same time, we're, we try to be as genuine as we can and be real. And like I told you before, we're not curing cancer. We're making beer. And so we're trying to take ourselves too seriously. We're proud of the product that we make. It's first and foremost. But at the end of the day, we make a product that a lot of people find a lot of enjoyment in. And that's fun for us. We're going to try a Country Boy beer batter. Oh, I can't wait. It's coming very straight. Why don't you, let's take a walk around and look. Yeah, absolutely. All right, come on. We're almost there. Now, we've got our Kentucky flower. We know who made that. Now I'm going to make this very simple, very quick. Just to make it easy, we're going to use two cups of flour. So I'm going to come back with my Cholula. I'm going to dump that much in there. Now you don't taste that in there, it just gives mm. it a nice taste. Let's go ahead and put 12 ounces in there and let's go ahead and mix that up. Very simple. Now we are making tilapia fish tacos, okay? Yummy. Smells good. Doesn't that smell good? Now let's look at consistency. Now, I also put just a little bit of Tony Chasseries in there. Now, this is the more spice seasoning, just to give it a little more spice in there. Won't hurt anything. Now, when you think about that, look at that beauty. Now, I could, I'd love to pitch that in there and eat that whole, but this is for tacos. So, if you will, Nikki, let's cut these up into pieces about like that. Okay. Just, just, go in a taco. just taco like size. Like about here? Yeah, a little bit bigger. And we're going to dry dip this. This, what will happen is, We'll get that dry on there, and that will make this adhere to that even better. And we're going to start dropping these into our 375 degree oil. And let's just keep on rolling with this, keep this assembly line going. You keep cutting? Yeah, if you will. And this is not going to take, these are tiny little pieces, so it's not going to take very long. I'm crazy, but you've had it. That's good. Use some ranch, a little bit of ketchup. I know what you're doing. A thousand island dressing. I know you think I'm crazy. You think I've lost my line. A little bit of mayonnaise, a little bit of Cholula. Boom. A little bit of lime juice. Smells good. Now what? A little more Tony. Mix that up. Now look at the color you have there. You've got the ranch. You've got the heat. Now, here's where we're going to start. With some big old honking pieces of fish. Now we could have used smaller pieces of fish, but why? Now, we're going to come back. You'll hold that right there. With some cilantro. With some red onion. I like your colors. With a little bit of white cabbage. A little bit of purple cabbage, a little bit of lime juice. Wow. Now we're coming back with our special sauce. So instead of cheese, we have a special sauce. Oh, we don't need cheese. You could try some cheese. Well, that's, I get to oh, try it. Mrs. Farmer. Wow. Yum. Oh, look, here's some fish. That fish is amazing. Mmm. Mmm. Can I just do this? Mr. Farmer, you can do whatever you want. That fish is delicious. Maybe we do narrow own pond. Those are good. Mmm. Mm. Wow. Everything on this table, we know where it came from. And it's within, I'd say the furthest we went for any of these was, was 30 miles. That's kind of nice, Isn't huh? that not nice to know that nowadays, today's day and age, you can go out. Mmm. Mm. Mm, mm. Pure and white. And come back with local stuff. Have we got soft taco shells? Mm -hmm. Now, Mrs. Farmer, while I'm making you a soft one here, I just have thought. Okay. If people wanted to check out what we're doing, where we're going, places we might be going, mm -hmm. they should check out our Facebook page, Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen, and like it. And also, if you have missed some recipes along the way, surely you haven't, but if you have, timfarmerscountrykitchen.com is a great place where you can get caught up in all our recipes 
And look what I have made that for you. That looks really good. Isn't that wonderful? Yum. I like that better. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? You know what? Um, That's good. Mm. It's that sad time where we have to look at each other with tears in our eyes and say, It's all about what? Good times. Good friends. Good friends who watch our show. That's right. Not just friends, but our extended family. Good and eats. good eats. Mm. And she next week. Mm -hmm. Now we can eat for like an hour. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mmm. Yum. Oh, yeah. To order a cookbook or DVD of the show, please call 502-319-0487 or email timfarmerck at gmail.com. Special thanks to Furniture World Superstore. House Warmings, Lodge Cast Iron, Tater Knob Pottery and Farm. <laughs> Funding for Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen is brought to you by Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office. Try something different tonight. L81 Bottling Company. Taste, love, and share the tradition. Diamond Gusset Jeans. The original Gusset Jean. Careful craftsmanship. Continual improvement. Diamond Gusset Jeans. Born and worn in the USA since 1987. Is it the insightful strategies and analytical capabilities that make Edward Jones one of the biggest financial services firms in the country? Or is it 13,000 financial advisors who take the time to say thank you? Night, Jim. Gonna be a while? I am, Liz. Got a little writing to do. It's why Edward Jones is the big company that doesn't act that way.